Doc Talk is brought to you by Multimin USA, manufacturers of Multimin 90, Sure Trace Mineral Supplementation by Timed Injection. Hi there, folks. Welcome to Doc Talk. I'm sure glad you joined us today. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University. We're going to have a great show. Dr. Matt Meisner is going to be joining us today, and we're going to talk about dehorning cattle something that's very common practice, something that all of us have done or continue to do. Stay tuned and I hope you enjoy the show. Uh, in our particular operation, we uh, lease a lot of pasture. So it's real important for these cattle to stay healthy. Uh, we don't get the opportunity to, to check them like we'd like to. Uh, it might be three or four days before we get through these cattle. Uh, the least sickness, the, the least foot rot we have, the better off we are. So uh, with the use of multi-men, uh, that's two of the big benefits we've seen. Healthier cattle, less foot rot, less maintenance. Closed caption brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. This segment is brought to you by Norbrook Laboratories, manufacturers of Normycin LA, Normectrum Plus, 1% and Poron the practical choice for your herd. Hi there folks, welcome to Doc Talk. Dr. Meisner, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here again. Folks, this is Dr. Matt Meisner and he's a friend and colleague here at Kansas State University's College of Veterinary Medicine's Veterinary Health Center and he is an assistant, sorry, associate clinical, you got that promotion, <laughs> associate <laughs> clinical professor here in, in our uh, Veterinary Health Center and he's boarded in medicine for food animals and we're talking about dehorning. Right. Very common. Something that uh, anybody on a, on a cattle operation has seen or probably performed. Um, from the time you're a young whippersnapper, you see things happen. And uh, it's one of those absolutely necessary procedures um, in a lot of cases to have done um, for various reasons. I think that first one we always think about is safety. You know, your my safety, veterinary safety, producer safety. Um, but not just uh, the people, and we also talk about the cattle as well. So you bet. their pen mates, um, maybe even the dog or any other horses or anything else that might be around. So other animals, anything that can get uh, traumatized by these horns um, need to be gone. And they can use those then to, to gore another animal. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people will say that we have horns to protect our animals from predators, but there's a lot of pulled cattle out there that raise good calves too. Absolutely, yeah. Um, think of it as a as a protective uh, part of the body. But um, and yes, I have seen some cattle that had horns, didn't have horns, and kind of moved down on the pecking order in the herd. But um, as we all know, they're plenty uh, defensive and protective with a lot of other appendages of their body too. So it's not yeah. necessary, absolutely needed to protect uh, calves. So safety and handling are one. But let's. Uh, what about economically? Well, economically, we talk about, you know, the trauma that you would think you'd see, but uh, bruising, you know, bruising and carcasses and uh, just bumping up against each other on those kind of things could lead to, you know, trim and extra different things that would happen to the carcass that, that it slaughtered. You know? I've actually seen some of the reports saying that uh, shipping animals to slaughter with horns versus pulled, that we can have anywhere from 0.2 to two pounds of trim. Right. So could be a significant a from, from bruising. Um, what about sometimes, you know, I see some of these, the horns will grow around and grow into the skull. Can those be an issue for the animal? Yes, um, they continue to grow. They don't stop just because they hit skin and hide. And uh, they uh, just continue to dig into skin and whatnot. We have to remove them. And sometimes they just grow abnormally. So uh, that's a possibility. Um, and then even just the facilities to handle them, you know, so we have to remove those so they don't knock them off um, going through chutes, alleyways, those kind of systems. Right. So safety for the animals. So, and then of course the last one was the surgical or what some people term the cosmetic dehorning. Yeah, um, sometimes we talk about cosmesis, but I do it more oftentimes to close skin to prevent flies infection from setting in. So we remove the horn and then close it back across. And so yes, it seems cosmetic, but has a function too. Cool. Well, I think those are some great kind of leads us off, gets us started on why we do it. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about what different types of techniques there are for horn removal on uh, cattle and how we do it without causing a lot of pain. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back after the break. 
This segment was brought to you by Brute Cattle Equipment, makers of the Brute Stealth Hydraulic Chute. If the chute fits, swear by it. Visit our website for more information. And by Lalaman Animal Nutrition, dedicated to the development and production of natural and differential solutions for animal nutrition. Beef producers need a practical choice when antibiotic therapy is required. More than ever, they are reaching for non-prescription Noramycin 300 LA from Norbrook, specially formulated to produce sustained antibiotic blood levels up to four days in cattle. Noramycin 300 LA delivers economic, broad-spectrum disease management for pneumonia, shipping fever, pink eye, wound infections, and foot rot. See for yourself why Norbrook's Noramycin 300 LA is the practical choice for your herd. Dr. Dan here. Whether I'm driving up and down the roads covering the state of Kansas, or I'm getting between Riley and Manhattan for my job, I'm driving a Ford truck. I'd like you to come out and visit my friends here at Dick Edwards Ford. They have a truck that'll suit your needs. Whether you're looking for power with a power stroke diesel, or if you're looking for fuel efficiency with the new EcoBoost engine, they got a truck that's just right for you. They're located two miles east of the Town Center Mall in Manhattan, Kansas, and they'll bend over backwards to help you. And I'll see you down the road. You know just how costly BRD can be, but did you know that bacteria like Manheimia and Pasteurella can cause BRD? That's why veterinarians and cattle raisers focus on preventing pasteurlosis with a quality vaccine like Pulmogard PHM-1. It's ready to use, highly syringable, and provides comprehensive protection with a single dose. For pasteurlosis protection that's truly the head of the class, ask your veterinarian about Pulmogard PHM-1. This segment is brought to you by Rotomix, manufactured in the USA and designed for feeding performance in the feedlots, beef production, dairy, and cow-calf operations. Hi there folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University and we're tickled that you joined us today. I'm joined by Dr. Matt Meisner, who's a veterinarian and boarded in internal medicine. He's an associate clinical professor working here in our veterinary health center and we're talking about dehorning cattle. And when we left for break, we we're talking about different reasons, and I think a lot of people know why we why we dehorn these animals. But now let's get into kind of the 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 meat of the the situation here and talk about the different techniques that we're going to use. Right. I think first and foremost, we want to make it as um, quick and efficient as possible. And uh, probably the most efficient, and quick, and easiest way to do it would be to take the horns off before they become mature. And uh, that'd be a disbudding type procedure. So that's before, that's while they're still, when they're young and the, you grab the horns and they're still moving with the skin, they haven't um, secured down to the skull. Sure, yeah, it's almost a little smooth, leathery button um, on a lot of calves. And, and we can take those off just by damaging what makes the horn uh, before huh. the bone grows. And, and we can do it with things like dehorning irons, which get hot, you know, and burn around that bud. Um, there's some paste, they're kind of caustic that you put on that destroy that, that, uh, that area of horn. And uh, little gouges and various methods to remove that bud quick, easy, um, off um, before it has a chance to mature. Um, oftentimes, bleeding is minimal, if any, um, and quick. How, uh, you know, when you're looking at that keratinized tissue, how far out around from that that horn do you need to get? Oh, a small bud. You know, we're getting out. Uh, it's nice to be a quarter, eight quarter inch outside that bud. You know, um, kind of hard to see it. There's kind of sort of a little raised bump, but you want to be outside of that area. Um, then, then let's move into the, some of the different things that you're going to do. Once that horn's attached to the skull, and now we have horn development, there, we're moving into different types of techniques. Yeah. Same thing goes, we still have to get outside what's making the horn. And what it actually is, is a piece of bone covered by um, horn. And so it's following that bone, bone up and we have to get that tissue that makes the horn. And uh, uh, there's several ways we can do that. Um, we've got probably the most common one would be a gouge or a Barnes type dehorner, which um, the horn fits within it. Um, we open the, the handle and we crush and, and take the horn skin and butt off that way. Um, we have various types of dehorners that will um, chop, trim, you know, guillotine types. Yeah, dehorners. keystone. Um, the keystone type, uh, really large horns. Um, we've got those. Um, and now let's, we probably need to back up a little bit because these are, this is dehorning. This right. is taking the horn the clear horn. off and getting the keratinized tissue, getting a margin around that, that horn and, and 
taking the whole thing. Right. Bone, horn, um, everything around the outside comes off with it. So yeah, that's a dehorning uh, method. And the other one which we showed about, we had wires. You know, we can use yep. OB wire or wire saws to cut those off. And uh, those are nice to get really hot and they actually cauterize as we go through. Any of these dehorning methods um, will have some bleeding and we can use these burners or different ways to heat could it to, um, to, to cauterize those vessels. But those are big dehorning, taking the entire thing off to the base. Um, then we have the tipping methods where basically you're taking the end of the horn um, where we're going to leave part of it, we're not going to take it to the base. Safer, less bleeding. Well, when we look at uh, many of these different methods, different ages, different animals, um, some complications can, can occur. So when we come back from the break, let's talk a little bit about some of those complications and we'll return right after the break. True Test Group, weighing systems, electronic identification, EID, electric fencing, and dairy automation systems help farmers and ranchers around the world manage the performance of their livestock for ultimate profitability. Got cattle? Rotomix manufactures a complete line of energy efficient rotary and vertical feed mixers for feedlots, beef production, dairy, and cow calf operations. Our mixers are available with the patented Generation 2 Staggered Rotor, the industry standard for feeding wet rations that include wet distiller's grain. Made in the USA, Rotomix mixers are designed for feeding performance that American cattlemen and dairy producers have come to expect. Rotomix, proud to offer a better mix in less time using less fuel. Cow-calf, stalker, and feedlot producers know that effective parasite control improves overall herd performance and profitability. Norbrook offers a comprehensive, economical line of boron and injectable parasiticides for every livestock operation. Consult with your local animal health supplier to set up a program that protects your investment and brings larger cattle checks this fall. See for yourself why the Noromectin line from Norbrook is the practical choice for your herd. This hog is head over hoof for meal made from U.S. soybeans. Now, one hog isn't that impressive, but suppose we add another, and another, and another. Before long, you've got billions of hungry customers around the world all clamoring for the same thing. Our soybeans. Learn more about the billion-dollar appetite of animal agriculture at beyondtheelevator.com. Brought to you by America's Soybean Farmers and their checkoff. <coughs> Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Hi there folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. I'm here with Dr. Matt Meisner. He's a veterinarian and he's also a boarded internal medicine specialist and we are talking about dehorning cattle. And when, when we dehorn, when we left, we were talking about tipping. And I think we'd backtrack just a little bit to, to kind of clarify the difference between dehorning and, the, and tipping. Yeah, tippings, oftentimes you'll see that um, with a lot of rodeo bulls, rough stock. Those is probably the most common place people had seen that, where you don't take the entire horn, you just take the tip or uh, portion back to, you know, silver dollar size blunted area. So you're blunting the horns. And so this is the insensitive part. It's kind of like clipping your fingernails the way I'd describe it. You're just trying to round that horn off so it's not pointed. They can't sure. use it as a weapon, but... And, and there's a little sensation can, there. <laughs> there's a little sensation, but very minimal. Um, and, and, but there's still some blood vessels, so you don't want to go too far. Um, that would lead to some of the complications that we can talk about as well. So, you know, disbudding, dehorning, tipping, and then there's, it's not always a benign procedure. It's a necessary, but we have to take some precautions. And I have seen some things in, in you know, feedlot, facilities where you know most people do a great job of tipping but the one thing that just kind of gets to me is when we tip that horn when we decide that tipping is going about halfway between the base of the horn and the tip and we're cutting through skull bone uh, very vascular area yeah might as well have just taken the whole thing off absolutely if yeah. you're going to do that yeah, so. and uh, you know, not just bone, blood, and whatnot, but now you're actually within the sinus cavity to a case of that horn will be hollow out that far. Absolutely. Know. So, you know, it kind of leads us to, to a spot, and I think that it's one of those that's a sensitive area. It's one of those that, 
that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis when we're talking about dehorning and that's pain control and making sure that these are painless procedures and what are some of the, I know that we can't make all procedures painless okay and sometimes our unintended consequences of making something painless can create more pain by running the animals through the chute more times increase the anxiety and stress but when when we're going to do some of these big dehorns right what are some of the things you recommend? Big dehorn. It's becoming standard of care in some of those situations. You know, you're right. If you're going to house them and group them, they can get traumatized. But we're going to numb it, um, the horn, so that we can do a good, safe job handling as quick, anytime we can. Small numbers, large horns. Um, I'm going to take the time, it doesn't take hardly at all, to numb the nerves that supply that horn. And uh, they resist less, um, so you have less trauma in the chute. It's less painful. You know, so it's one of those things that uh, all in all, less stress, less pain, less uh, um, of a big to-do to get it done. And uh, I think that standards of care require us to do that. Yep, work with a local veterinarian and, yep. and get your, uh, either get the product or have the veterinarian come out and do those big dehorns. Yep. Well, I think it's important. And I think when we come back, we're gonna have one more segment, but let's come back and talk about some of the problems that can go on how we solve those and then how we can move forward to prevent them. Thanks for being here. Thank you for watching us. We'll be back with more Doc Talk right after the break. This segment is brought to you by Purple Wave Auction, the easiest, most straightforward way to sell used equipment. Purple Wave, straight, simple, sold. This is Agriculture Today from Kansas State University. K-State's College of Agriculture has just entered into a five-year research partnership with a major agribusiness firm in pursuit of an up-to-now elusive advance in crop genetics, hybrid wheat. Kansas State's Ernie Minton explains that this effort will lean heavily on the vast resources of K-State's renowned Wheat Genetics Resource Center. This deal is actually with between Bayer Crop Science and really the work of the WGRC and the thought there is that perhaps in this collection that Dr. Gill has, there are important genes that uh, maybe could be useful in terms of uh, moving hybrid uh, wheat along. This is K-State Research and Extension. The Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine is a leader in food animal research and education. Our researchers are constantly expanding the knowledge of animal health and food safety. Through the Veterinary Health Center, and the Kansas State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, we provide practical services for animal producers. Home of the Beef Cattle Institute, the college is committed to animal welfare training and research. The Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine, knowledge and service for the future of animal production. Hi, I'm Kevin Auctioner, host of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman and Colorado Rancher. Join me each week as the National Cattlemen's Beef Association brings you the latest updates in industry information and market news. Plus, each week we provide important educational information and features on cattlemen from across the country just like you. And we can't forget our favorite cowboy poet, Paxter Black. Join me for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, debuting Tuesday nights at 8.30 Eastern right here on RFD TV. Multiman is one of those products you can use to uh, get the ultimate uh, performance out of cattle. Around 90 to 95% of our calves are uh, either AI or embryo transplant. Uh, since we've started using the Multiman, we're up around 70 to 75% uh, conception on our first AI service. And a product like this is very beneficial for us. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hi there folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Matt Meisner. We are both from Kansas State University's College of Veterinary Medicine and Matt is Associate Clinical Professor, works in our referral clinic and also does some, some haul-in ambulatory work here at Kansas State University's Veterinary Health Center on many cattle and we're talking about dehorning. Gone through the whys, the hows, the pain free. And now let's get to some of the problems that can occur. Well, first and foremost, we always think of hemorrhage or severe bleeding and uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, you don't wear your nice clothes a lot of times when you're doing these kind of procedures and uh, 
Um, so there's a lot of bleeding and we're going to take every precaution we can to control it. Whether that's actually find the vessels and twist those down or use some powders to help a clot form or heat, you know, hot irons um, can Cauterize. cauterize it, yep. you know. So, so bleeding would be far and above um, the quick, the immediate thing that we're going to do. So we could prevent that by doing them early on, you know, very little bleeding, or we just take some precautions to take care of it at the time. And I think that's the key. If you're going to dehorn, do it as early as possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Quick. I think um, people are, would be amazed to know that 50% of the dairy cows are born with horns. Right. Right. You know, but right. you never see a horn in the parlor. No. No. And, and they take care of them as babies. As babies. So, I mean, we do that on a routine basis at the dairies. And yeah. so, take care of them. All right. Back to, back to the issues. But one of them that, that we see, too, is, is flies, right? Right. So, after we take care of the horn, we're going to have an open wound that's going to have to take time to heal. And flies laying eggs lead to maggots. And uh, um, so, fly control, repellents, those kind of things to prevent uh, infection that way. Um, and, uh, you know, the wound itself can get infected, but I think flies are a big hindrance. And so that's the situation where we might go back to a surgical dehorn where we can remove the horn and then take the skin and suture it back across the wound. Um, a lot less likely to get infected or flies. And I think that, you know, flies carry a lot of different bacteria that people don't realize, E. coli, salmonella, and probably some of our pathogens that, that'll set up some of these, these infections of the wounds. Sure. Yeah. Um, about the sinusitis, and I think this is the one that kind of, you know, when you're opening up that sinus uh, with a dehorn, we can have some issues here. Sure, and it's, it's an ascending, so now we're getting even deeper than just a superficial wound. It seals over, that hollow horn or those vessels travel right into the front part of that forehead of that um, bovine and uh, can set up an infection, sinusitis sets in, headache, and then we have a now a, just a pus-filled sinus and, and uh, really difficult to treat. I mean, I, uh, you can see some discharge from the nose occasionally, but you'll see them um, occasionally head pressing in a, in, a, in a wall or a fence, just like you would with a sinus headache. And uh, hard to treat. Um, we try to get that drained, but we try to prevent that by uh, getting good drainage antibiotics and wound care early on. So, yeah, clean equipment and work with your veterinarian. Right. Thanks for, for being here today. Glad to be here. Fun time. Did a great job. Folks, remember, always work with your local veterinarian. And if you want to know more about what we do on DocTalk, you can find us at DocTalkTV.com. Thanks to Dr. Meisner for joining us here today. Lots of things to know about dehorning. Work with your local veterinarian. Thanks for watching DocTalk today. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson, and I'll see you down the road. Closed caption brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. Doc Talk, produced in cooperation with Drovers Cattle Network and Bovine Veterinarian. For more information about this program or previous programs, go to DocTalkTV.com. Doc Talk was brought to you by Multimin USA, manufacturers of Multimin 90, sure trace mineral supplementation by timed injection. Multimin 90 is an injectable trace mineral product that contains selenium, copper, manganese, and zinc. One injection provides approximately a, a 60 to 90 day supply for any treated animal. Trace minerals that are ingested by the animal are absorbed relatively inefficiently from the gut. Uh, in addition, other elements in the animal's diet, other nutrients can interfere with trace mineral absorption from the gut. By injecting a supplemental source of trace mineral, um, we miss those sources of interference. In other words, injectable trace minerals are absorbed with nearly 100% efficiency and, and used much more efficiently by the animal. The most critical times for trace mineral nutrition in a breeding cow's life are the period immediately preceding calving and the period immediately preceding breeding. We try to treat mature cows, mature breeding cows, uh, about 60 days before each of those critical time periods starts. Late gestation and early lactation are going to provide the, the biggest drain on a cow's body reserves for critical trace minerals. We need to replace those before breeding occurs in order to give that female an optimum chance of becoming 
of, of conceiving and becoming pregnant for the subsequent production year. Now in our study at Kansas State University, uh, our cows had access to a self-fed trace mineral product. Uh, our treated cows were injected at preg check in December and then again approximately four weeks before the breeding season began. The result of our research was a 9% greater AI conception rate and a calving distribution that was shifted forward into the calving season approximately 13%. In other words, we had more calves born earlier in the season than we did in untreated cows. Hi there folks, Dr. Dan from Doc Talk. Be sure to join me here next week as my guest will be Dr. Matt Meisner from Kansas State University's Veterinary Health Center. We're going to talk about different techniques to dehorn cattle. We'll talk about things such as reducing the pain when you dehorn and how to prevent complications and different techniques that you can use. Be sure to join me here every Monday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on RFD TV and I'll see you down the road. Hi there, I'm Dr. Dan from Doc Talk. Be sure to join me next week as we're going to discuss different techniques to dehorn cattle. Be sure to join me here every Monday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on RFD TV and I'll see you down the road.